We have been busy. So the CIS action team, as you all know, probably is one of three action teams on search. Um, there's the CIS action team, the permafrost action team, and the land ice action team. And um, just uh, the beginning of this month, the first few days of September, we had uh, a major conference um, for search, and a bunch of you, I'm sure, were there, called the Arctic Futures 2050. And it was, um, we worked really hard on organizing this conference to make it not your typical science conference. It was really more geared towards trying to engage with policymakers. We held it at the National Academies building in Washington, DC. And we had a, a really great turnout, actually. Um, we had almost 400 attendees. Um, almost about 20 of them were policy, oh no, sorry, more like 100 had some relate, some influence or some connection to policy making. So we feel pretty good about that. Um, there was about uh, 22 plenary sessions including 14 panel sessions, and we had a tabletop demonstration. So it was a very different kind of a conference. Um, the, one of the major roles of the Sea Ice Action Team in this conference was organizing a 90-minute um, session on the second day of this three-day conference that was called Melting Ice and Thawing Permafrost, Local, Regio Regional, Global Implications. And um, it included five, um, presenters and a moderator and we basically started with we started and ended with stories um, the first story was local uh, uh, an indigenous person um, oh her name was Maya Lucan and she talked about the Bering Sea and all the issues that they've been facing there the last couple winters, which have had so little sea ice there, and how their communities have been trying to deal with um, policy and cultural effects of the sea ice, but also resilience and um, you know really looking forward how to deal with this issue. Um, we then had a speaker from each of the action teams talking about their science. And then we ended with David Behar, who is an expert on um, freshwater systems and sea level rise. And so kind of bringing it out to the global perspective of the loss of ice in the Arctic. So it was a really great session. And we had a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in that. Um, sea ice action team members also participated in three of the panel discussions. And I was um, part of the tabletop exercise, which was looking at a, um, a scenario in the Bering Sea area. You know, it was an imaginary scenario, but um, what would happen if we had a major um, shipping event there? Um, you know, the, the Army, the, uh, sorry, the Navy, the Coast Guard, um, we had all kinds of people involved in talking about what this might look like unfolding and um, what we wish we had known back in 2020 to help us with this event that was projected to happen in 2050. So it was a really interesting event. Um, another major project the CIS Action Team is working on, it's actually happening as I speak right now. We have hired um, a journalist, Eli Kintich, who was um, a reporter for Science Magazine for many years. He's now uh, kind of a freelance videographer. And he, as well as Matt Druckenmiller, are out in the Bering Sea communities right now in Nome, and I'm not sure where else they're going, doing a series of short videos, um, which I think are gonna be absolutely fascinating, interviewing a bunch of um, the local people there. Um, we've also got a couple of papers in the works and um, you know, we've all been involved in numerous <clears throat> science commu communication activities here, there, and everywhere, including a TED Talk by uh, Twyla Moon, who's the, one of the heads of the Land Ice Action Team. So um, it's been a really busy, really busy year. Um, looking forward to these videos that are coming out. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Jen. Uh, I have a quick question. What do you wish you had known in 2020? <laughs> For that scenario, um, we wish we had had a lot more 
um, monitoring um, sites for both weather and also I'd call it ocean weather. So um, the scenario was that um, a ship carrying toxic material went aground um, near somewhere in the Bering Sea and was leaking an unknown amount of toxic material. And we had, we wish we had good enough information about the currents and winds in the Bering Straits and Bering Sea region to be able to do trajectories for where this material would end up. Um, so that was one thing. Um, and also the, I think the, the um, uh, Coast Guard people on the panel would have liked to have known what the resources were in the region in terms of the um, indigenous people, what sort of boats they had, um, where they were located, um, what they had in the way of um, evacuation plans, that sort of thing. So it was a, it was a really interesting, <laughs> a really interesting um, exercise. And it, it was all video. So um, all of the presentations from the conference are now um, online. So if anybody wants to watch that, it's, it's there. Mm. Great. Maybe we could get the uh, link to, to that posted on the IARPIC collaboration if it's not already. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Is there another question? Вот, у меня даже есть этот information. Okay, I'm going to post the link to it right now. В середине сентября. Okay, thanks, Jen. Are there any other other uh, questions for Jen? Hi, Jen. This is Betsy Turner Bogren with Arcus. The uh, lessons learned that, or the uh, questions of what you would have wanted to know in 2020 it reminds me of the lessons learned from the deep water horizon that you know several years ago did the were some of them was there any overlay or comparison to those lessons learned yes in fact there was um a woman from the navy and i don't have all those names right in front of me right now but um she had been involved in in that recovery and that um, response so she had some really interesting lessons learned to uh, report to the group um, and you know just how how difficult it is to think about all the potential um, issues that can arise and uh, potential um, people and resources that might be needed in any given disaster like that so um, but they learned a lot from that, she said, and, um, you know, going forward and doing these sorts of real tabletop exercises. This was more of a demonstration um, type um, exercise, but uh, she said it's, it's, they've learned a lot from that. And um, they're, as they move forward, of course, it's a different situation in the Arctic, but um, they, they definitely can apply some of what they learned in this case. Thanks. Good question, Betsy. Anybody else with questions? Uh, yes, this is Renee Tatesco. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, I can, Renee. Hi. I'm with the National Weather Service, the uh, Alaska region headquarters here in Anchorage. Um, has, was was uh, anybody from the Arctic Domain Awareness Center uh, involved in, in that meeting by any chance? Yes. I'm looking at the list of people who are on that panel now, and um, Randy Church Key was there. Uh-huh. Okay. So he was on the panel? Excellent, uh, because I know he has hosted a number of workshops um, here in Anchorage over the last couple of years where uh, they have focused on various tabletop exercises. And the one that just took place this past May um, was on a similar sort of um, um, situation as what you described. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that ADAC was plugged into that. I'd be interested in any uh, feedback that church might have offered. Right. 
Um, if my memory were better, I could whip that off for you right now, but um, I think you're going to have to watch the video. Um, but the woman I was just mentioning um, with respect to the deep water um, catastrophe there was Rebecca Pincus, and she was from the U.S. Naval War College. So there are some pretty, pretty cool people on this panel. It was very interesting. Thanks, Renee. Any other questions for Jen? Okay, I think thanks so much, Jen, for that great update. You sound busy, and I am also <laughs> excited to see these videos. It's excellent to see this level of communication going on with regard to, you know, what's going on in the Arctic and also the ever increasing uh, connectivity between uh, research and I think local communities uh, is really encouraging. Yeah, and Eli Kintich is a real pro, so um, they're going to be really good, I think. He's done some other really interesting Arctic work, so if you want to Google him, um, he went on a ship last January and did a series of videos about that. He was up uh, east of Spitsbergen. Um, so he's a very experienced guy and he's an excellent writer and I think they're going to be really good. So we're excited. <laughs> Super. Can you give us the na his name in the chat as well? Yeah, so yeah, folks yeah. can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so without further ado, a drum roll, we have uh, Walt Meyer on and I think we're going to get to hear a bit about the, uh, the uh, sea ice minimum for September 2019. Walt. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, this will work. Can everyone see that? Yeah, yes, sir. Everyone sees that? Okay. Um, all right, thanks, thanks, Jackie. Um, so, yeah, as folks probably uh, have been following along, um, we, we basically have had a photo finish for second place. Um, so uh, you look at the, this is our daily uh, at NSIDC. We, we were at 4.15 million square kilometers on September 18th was the minimum. Um, and uh, that ties with uh, 2016 and 2007, essentially a second lowest. Um, and you can see the pattern there on the left. Oops, why can I not advance? Uh -oh. Having trouble advancing my. Slide. You might have to do it with um, by like clicking the arrow. That's uh... Uh, okay. I'll do that. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you. So uh, just to kind of compare the um, spatial patterns to show this. So the the 2019 is kind of the the light lighter blue shade or medium blue shade, and then overlaying in white either 2016, 2007, or and then 2012. Um, and so, like in 2016, a little bit more ice kind of in the, the Bering Chukchi sector, but without the kind of um, loose groups of flows there, but less in the Lap Hev Sea. In 2007, um, you know, it didn't get pushed as far northward in the, kind of the East Siberian sector, but somewhat less ice in the Beaufort Sea area. And then 2012, um, it was pretty much for the most part kind of just retracted farther around the almost the entire perimeter, uh, except like the East Greenland Sea area and a little bit in the, the Laptev Sea. So it was, there's definitely some variability there in, in terms of where the, the ice edge ended up um, in between the three different years. Um, I think one of the things that's kind of interesting, instead of just looking at one year or, or comparing a couple years, um, looking at kind of the broader range in the, in the trends in the ice. Um, and uh, this is a nice figure that Michonne Scott here at NCIDC put together. And I think one of the sobering things to my mind is you know, the last 13 years, so starting in 2007 through this year, um, those are the lowest 13 years in the 41 year record, um, which I think is pretty interesting. And I'll come back to that in a couple minutes uh, to show you that, but you can see here the top 10 uh, listed uh, in the tie for second place there. Um, and looking at kind of what 
what kind of led to this, at least it has some initial thoughts on that, you know, uh, and I, I don't, I, I won't claim that these are complete or, or detailed, but uh, I think some initial things to, to look at. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, and as folks are probably aware, you know, one of the things was a really low bearing sea ice extent, again, uh, into the, through the winter and into the spring. Uh, we had a little bit of a late ice growth in, in the second half of March, uh, as you can see, uh, but that was obviously all quite thin ice and, and melted away very quickly. So we were coming into May uh, with very little ice uh, compared to normal. And you see that in the right and the melt onset date, obviously the Bering Sea, and then that led into the Chukchi Sea and the, and the Beaufort Sea as well, I think, uh, having very early melt dates. Uh, if you can't see those numbers, it's, it's a month or more uh, earlier than normal. Uh, in terms of uh, melt onset dates. Um, so you, you're looking at the atmosphere now, uh, one of the things, you know, and the temperatures, not surprisingly, uh, we had warm temperatures through the summer, June, July, and August. Um, and that's been pretty typical through the, through the last several years. Uh, it's always warm. And of course, some of that is, is because of the loss of ice is feeding into the atmosphere as well. Um, the sea level pressure is pretty interesting. If you look at a June through August average, it's it's kind of not very <laughs> distinctive. It's pretty flat pressure gradient, um, not much going on in the in the central Arctic there. Um, but of course, that's looking at a three month mean. Um, looking at monthly means, you see something a, a fair diff, fair amount different. Um, you do see some some pretty notable pressure gradients and changes. Uh, in, in the pressure patterns. June is kind of a somewhat of a you know, typical Beaufort gyre high over north of Alaska, um, but then in July and August you, you have that high pressure shifting, somewhat of a dipole uh, expression I would say. Um, and even, I, I'm not, I'm not going to show that, but even as we got into late August and into September we saw some pretty dramatic shifts in the, in the pressure patterns, which led to shifts in the winds. And that led to kind of a, a wavy finish to the, the uh, end of the melt season where we had a false minimum in early September at times when it you know, almost stopped decreasing uh, and then picked up again later on. And that was, looks to be largely due to shifts in the winds uh, reflecting the, the pressure patterns. Uh, the other thing that we we had again, this is not something that's I think too surprising, and, and something we've seen fairly commonly uh, is a lot of uh, heat in the ocean, high SSTs. Um, even as early as early July in the Chukchi Sea, you can see that it's basically saturated five degrees Celsius above normal in the Chukchi Sea, and then uh, expanding. Uh, kind of the maximum temperature, at least as I kind of qualitatively looked at it, was towards the end of August in the middle. Uh, and again, you know, five degrees and above uh, temperature anomalies around the pretty much the whole perimeter of, uh, of the Arctic, except for the, the Beaufort Sea area. And, uh, and then, you know, things are starting to freeze up here as we reach the week of the minimum on the right. Um, but still a lot of heat in the ocean uh, as we head into the, into the freeze up season. So I, I expect, expect it's gonna be a, a fairly flip, slow freeze up for a time. Um, this is uh, something, uh, the minimum date people oftentimes ask about this. Um, and you, there is a small increasing trend. It's only about a day per decade. Uh, but it's very noisy and it's not significant. Um, and that's not, again, too surprising, I think, when folks think about it. Weather is going to play a big role in, the, in this specific date of the minimum. And we saw that uh, this year where, like I said, we had pretty much a slowdown and, and even a bit of an increase during the first week of September due to the weather. But then it, it did pick, the, you know, it did, weather patterns changed and, and we saw a further decline. But if the weather patterns hadn't changed, we would have had a, a pretty early minimum. Um, so it's an interesting thing, but I don't think it's telling us much. Um, but just showing that. Uh, what what is more interesting, of course, is is the actual extent trends, and and everyone's familiar with this graph, um, and um, and what it's showing is the long term downward trend. 
but something struck me or struck me in the past, but I, I thought worth mentioning here, um, you know, there's, there's a definite shift um, starting in 2007, it, it appears to be, at least to, to my mind. If you look at the trends, uh, overall, you get, you know, about 82,000 square kilometers per year. If you go through 2006, it's somewhat less, um, but 2007, uh, shows almost no trend 2007 to 2019 um, you know no significant no significant trend at all and, and almost a zero trend just very small declining trend and um, that that as I was preparing this I, I just kind of quickly got me thinking and I went through and calculated the trends for every 13 year period starting in 1979 um, and this last 13 years is the lowest uh, declining trend the lowest magnitude trend in the record. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. It raises, at least in my mind, some interesting questions going forward. Um, but you know, we had essentially before, through 2006, we never had a minimum uh, below 5.3 million square kilometers. And since then, we've never had one built, uh, above that. Um, so it's definitely a shift. Uh, it seems to be, to at least to some degree, in, in, the, uh, in the minimum ice extents. I think one of the reasons for that is is the the ice thickness and the ice age we as folks have probably seen we've lost a lot of the older ice types um, 1984 and the upper left versus 2019 obviously very dramatic change in the four plus year old ice um, but as folks may remember uh, you know in 2006 we had definitely lost a lot of the thick multi-year ice but um, there was still quite a bit of it in the in the Beaufort Sea and Chukchi Sea region, reaching fairly far south. But in 2007, we had this you know pretty dramatic invection of ice and really persistent winds and persistent ice motion through the summer that kind of pushed that out and cleared out the Beaufort Chukchi East Siberian region. And, and I think that probably plays some role in terms of allowing more ocean heat in there. Um, and uh, you know, getting rid of the thick ice, thicker and older ice there. And what we've seen since then um, is is kind of a, a loss of uh, retention of of the thicker ice. This is an animation that uh, worked with the NASA Scientific Visualization Studio. I won't play this whole thing um, because it goes from 1984, but I think it's kind of interesting to look at, uh, kind of going to 2006 and into 2007, hopefully this is playing on folks, but you kind of see everything gets crushed down. And since then in the Beaufort and Chukchi, the multi-year ice seems to be melting out largely. Um, and so we're not retaining the multi-year ice, um, but what we, in that area, but what we do have is that the ice in the farther north region is, is still resilient. Um, so we're not losing more and more ice, except in certain extreme years like 2012. Um, and so I think there is this kind of shift in terms of the, the, the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas and East Siberian are, are just not having uh, much of any of the older, thicker ice um, that we used to see there. Um, and so, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens from here. So just uh, finishing up here, you know, the, the summer melt season, I think it's largely been fairly typical of recent years. We did, we had early melt onset, the low, Bearing, uh, bearing C, starting things out. Um, but again, that's something that's not been uh, too unusual, warm ocean and air temperatures. We didn't have a, a perfect storm of conditions as we did in 2012, so we didn't go as far. We were ahead of 2012 pace for a while, even into August, so it was looking to be quite interesting, but then things slowed down pretty dramatically uh, this year compared to 2012. And again, kind of just uh, recapping with the, the transition between the minimum in 2006 to the 2007, um, it's kind of an interesting uh, transition. You know, why did that happen? Um, 2007 infection is probably one reason. And you know, at least the question, are we gonna have another step change? And if so, when would that be? Um, and you know, the, the question that always is on people's minds, you know, when are we gonna have a, a new record minimum? Uh, set. So that's uh, that's all I have. And if anyone has any questions, welcome to entertain them. 
Uh, yes, this is Moeen. I do have a question, What? Uh, so when you talk about the minimum ice here, actually you're talking the daily minimum because it looks yeah. like this year we may not be the second. Even as far as monthly? Months. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 that's true. Um, I, we don't have the monthly data in yet. Um, right. We have to wait one more day. Um, so I, it shows, shows to show the minimum. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it usually correlates quite well, but um, it, it can be a little bit, you know, it depends on obviously the, the individual days. So we may mm. not end up as a tie, um, but it, it will be in the top uh, or the lowest four. Um, amongst those, or most five amongst those, uh, those years, most four, sorry. Yeah. Hey, Walt, uh, there's been a discussion about um, a divergence between sea ice extent and sea ice area in recent years. Can you say anything about uh, that trend for 2019? Uh, I haven't looked at that yet. That's interesting, uh, an interesting point. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we definitely see uh, more broken up ice during summer. Um, one of the issues with, with the passive microwave data that we have is it's, it can be difficult to disentangle um, because you do get a, a bias in the, in the concentration due to the surface melt. So how much is maybe more melt uh, on the surface versus actually more open water within the ice pack? Um, I would say you, we have seen, at least in certain areas, uh, a lot of more broken up and looser ice flows with open water, um, but still above 15%. So they're counting in the extent, but would lower the, the area. Um, but I think that's an interesting area to look into further. Hey, uh, Walt, this is Hayo. Um, I, I was uh, interested in your comment about early melt onset. If you look at the, uh, the data for the Pacific Arctic sector, you know, and you showed that as well, Coxview Sound, for example, stands out. There's a few other areas with very early melt onset. And based on what we've seen and some of the coastal observations, there was definitely much earlier onset of surface melt, but at the same time, in particular for, for the Southern Chukchi, Northern Bering, you just never had uh, a uh, uh, sort of an extent sea ice cover established this year as well. So my question is, to, what, what is the definition of melt onset? Is, is it reduction in ice concentration or is it actual detection of surface melt from passive microwave? So it's, it's kind of a, this is, this is from uh, Torsten Marcus's and, and Jeff Miller's algorithm. Um, there's also the, the uh, Anderson and Drobot algorithm that we have here at NSIDC as well. And there's some differences between them and differences how they approach it. Um, but the, the primary detection is, is looking for surface water and the effect of the passive microwave signal. So it, it is melt. However, if melt is not detected that way, um, it does look at concentration um, and looks at lack of ice cover. So lack of ice cover will be, uh, will be calculated as an early melt onset date. So, if there is no ice or very little ice and it retreats, then that, that does go into a, it, it is registered as an early melt onset. So that's probably why, uh, you know, some of those dates are so early is because there just wasn't much of any ice in those areas as the melt was starting. But that's, a, that's a good point, yeah. Are there other questions? Thanks very much, Walt. I mean, it's really interesting that it almost kind of appears like the Central Arctic has reached a, 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 at least an intermittent equilibrium, if you will, and now so much is happening uh, change-wise in the peripheral seas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, what, what are we going to see when, you know, how, how much more heat and <laughs> energy do we need to, uh, to melt that, start, start getting into the, the higher latitudes? Yeah. For sure. Any other questions? Again, thanks, Walt. That was really clearly done, and I'm looking forward to seeing some of this in the Arctic report card. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, in 2019. Yep. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah. So uh, 
Meredith, did uh, Lynette, was she, you ever chase her down? Yep, yep. Sorry, I was, uh, I had another meeting run late today, so, but I'm here now. <laughs> I hate when that happens. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, Lynette, why didn't you tell us uh, how things are going with uh, Icebridge? Okay, yeah, I can, let me share my screen. Do. Sweet. So, um, yeah, so uh, I was, I just got back from um, our summer campaign um, a couple weeks ago. Um, and so we were based out of Thule Greenland for this campaign. And the idea of it was um, to focus on different melting surfaces of the sea ice, snow, and uh, land ice in Greenland. Um, and I'm the deputy project scientist for NASA's Operation Icebridge. So um, it just worked out with timing and issues with the plane that I got to be there for the whole summer campaign um, at the end of the day. So before um, we actually had the campaign, we um, we're going to be based out of both Thule and Kangaroo Luswak starting in August 19th and ending in September 15th. And like I said, we wanted to look at um, how the lasers, uh, our ATM lasers um, interacted with different uh, types of surface melt so we can better interpret our ISAT2 returns uh, over the, the melting s uh, snow and sea ice and then over the land ice and the melt ponds there and the dirty ice and other conditions that are seen in the summer months. And so we're, uh, for this campaign, we're, we were using a new NASA aircraft to us. It's our G5 and it's located in Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And uh, for this campaign on board, we had um, our ATM T6 and T7 laser altimeters. We had a snow radar, which is the first time we've used a snow radar in the summer months. Um, we had CAMBOT, which is um, a camera, FLIR, which is infrared, and then a head wall, which is a hyperspectral um, imager on board. And so we wanted to get um, a few, a couple um, underflights of ISAT-2 uh, on the sea ice so we can, you know, compare our snow radar and our ATM data with what ISAT-2 is getting and also seeing how um, ATM and ISAT-2 penetrates uh, in melt ponds. So we wanted to have a threshold of two flights um, and a baseline of four of these missions during, during the field. And then for land ice, again, we wanted to look at um, different areas of the Greenland ice sheet a uh, change in height versus time from um, the same lines that we flew in the springtime to see seasonal uh, changes and also flying over, again, me different melting surfaces and uh, different dirty ice, bare ice, uh, things like that. So we had basically, we plan to have four weeks in the field and, you know, be able to fly at least 10 missions to make this campaign viable. So what actually happened is um, the G5 plane, when it was set to take off to fly to Thule, uh, had an engine failure. So um, they had to land, do an emergency landing back in Houston and fix the problem, but it took a little bit longer than expected. So um, the G5 actually arrived in Thule, Greenland on September 2nd. Um, and we were only in the field until the 15th, which, which was the day we flew home. So we only had 11 viable days to fly. And one of those is a Sunday. And so in Thule, the airport's closed on, on a Sunday. So we only actually had 10 days to fly. And we actually flew a mission each of those 10 days. So we ended up getting 10 missions in roughly 11 days and being in Thule. And so that was really exciting that we, you know, the weather worked in our favor. Um, so we had, we got one high priority sea ice mission under an ISAT-2 track and then part of another uh, Lagrangian tracked sea ice mission. Um, but I can talk about that later. And then we got a bunch of um, high priority and medium priority uh, land ice missions. So that uh, this, this figure is just showing um, all of all of our flight lines that we were able to achieve in this summer smelt. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about this sea ice track, um, this, this racetrack mission for the sea ice. Um, so it was under a uh, ISAT-2 reference ground track, and we were actually able to get a zero latency between IceBridge and the ISAT-2 satellite, which is really good for comparisons. Um, during this flight, we also saw lots of um, melt ponds that were, you know, fully melty or also beginning to refreeze and then also lots of ridged ice like in this figure on the bottom left i mean the bottom right and um also you know completely refrozen over melt ponds and new snow so a lot of different surfaces um during this campaign we also was, was working with uh isat2 and an instrument called avaris which is a um hyperspectral instrument. Um, and so they were able to actually fly on part of this sea ice line that we got to, f that ice bridge flew on and also had zero latency with the uh, ISAT-2 satellite. So that was really good. Um, here is just some um, examples of the data. So this is um, taken from a quick look uh, elevation swath of, from our ATM T6 wide scan laser of the sea ice um, during this racetrack mission. So you can see some of the higher elevations where the ice is ridged and you can pick out the some of the sea ice flows and things like that. And then the the figure on the left is just showing the this CAMBOT camera uh, image of a partially refrozen superglacial lake on a land ice mission. But just to give you an idea of that as well. Um, this was the first time we had snow radar uh, during an ice bridge summer campaign, which is really kind of interesting to see these returns over the sea ice. Um, and this was one that was, this figure was made by Jilu um, during the, during the racetrack flight that we were on together. And so I kind of find this interesting, maybe get feedback from everyone else listening, but it kind of looks like uh, in this, in this echogram, you can kind of see two separate dark layerings in the snow and ice interface. I'm guessing like the top gray parts is a snowpack or a new snow and this middle dark darker gray line might be like reef like a free frozen ice lens in the snow or something like that and then the bottom line is the ice pack but the, then again I'm not sure so just I just thought it was an interesting thing to look at since we haven't really seen something like this in the summer over the sea ice. Uh, here's just a picture of uh, a couple leads and some sea ice flows and some melt ponds on it. That was really pretty <laughs> that I took. And so, yeah, like I said, we were able to fly 10 missions out of 10 possible fly days. And we had, we collected 46.3 um, hours of science data. We flew over a lot of ISAT-2 ground tracks, um, almost 3,000 nautical miles of them during this campaign. And we had zero latency um, on our sea ice flight that I talked about and also on an ISAT-2 north land ice flight. Um, thankfully, since we were only based at Atuli because of a shortened campaign, um, the G5 crew and also the range of the of the plane um, kind of saved us because we were able to do or fly a few um, land ice missions that were originally only based out of Kangaroo Slack when we had a, a different plane like the P3 that doesn't have as good of a, a range and speed as the G5. And again, we were able to collect data on lots of different melting snow and ice surfaces, which is ideal and what we had planned and hoped for. Uh, we also did some outreach um, during this campaign. So we had people at NASA Goddard in our social media uh, department that, you know, posted some of our pictures on Instagram and Twitter and even um, the even NASA headquarters posted stuff on their inter their Na at NASA Instagram page. So we had a lot of likes. Um, and then I also took over the AGU um, Instagram for a few days. I was asked to do that. I was a guest Instagrammer. So I posted a bunch of things during the campaign and reached about 30,000 people as well. And so we have one more final campaign for Icebridge. It's um, this 
coming fall in a couple of weeks. Um, and it's going to be based out of Hobart, Australia, and we're going to be flying over areas of East Antarctica and also the sea ice there. So I'll be leaving again in a couple of weeks for that campaign. Um, and we're going to be again using the G5 because of its uh, speed and range. And on that, we're going to have ATM T6 and T7 radars, also the snow radar, I mean lasers, the snow radar. Um, we're going to have uh, McCords as well, which is a different radar. And also um, IMAR, which is a bathymeter uh, on board for bathymetry underneath the ice. And that time frame is um, our first possible science flight will be October 21st, and we'll be heading home from Hobart on November 24th. And um, this is just, you know, showing some of our baseline threshold amount of flights or missions we'd like to achieve while we're there. So we're looking at hopefully getting at least five um, sea ice missions, some ISAT-2 underflights and some, um, one is actually going to be a in-situ snow thickness survey overflay out on some fast ice uh, outside of KC Station. Uh, we're going to have a couple people going down there for ISAT and they're going to be taking a lot of snow measurements. So we're hoping to fly over them one day and, you know, get some um, good measurements of with, with our snow radar on board and as along with ISAT too. And I think that's it. Yep. So I'll leave it there. I guess I'll open up to questions or anything like that. Thanks, Lynette. Yep. Um, so this is that the Antarctic campaign, then the last official ice bridge campaign yep. for the program. It's Yep, it's the last official campaign. <laughs> and Sadly. is are there any other uh, is there any sort of an airborne program envisioned in the future that would uh, be done in coordination with uh, the satellite um, imagery um, or measurements? I, so not one that's going to be called Ice Bridge, but I think there are some plans to do much smaller, shorter um, CalVal campaigns in the future for ISAT too. And would those include sea ice as well as land ice? Or? Yes, yeah. yeah, it would be both. <laughs> okay, great. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions for Lynette? Hi, it's Martin. Hi. <laughs> um, Lynette, thanks. Um, it was reported just today that a large, very large, Iceberg has just broken off the Amory ice shelf. Um, you might want to look that up and okay. maybe there's an opportunity there for some um, re, re planning of uh, flight lines and so on. Okay, yeah, I'll take a note of that right now. Okay, Martin, is there anything uh, that is, is available? Could you put any kind of a link or something towards that report or is it just word of mouth for the people in the know? Well, it's on the BBC website. I'll send the URL. Mm -hmm. I'll send it out via the chat now. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so, so thanks again, Lynette um, and Walt and also Jen, who I think at this point is offline. Um, but let's open it up for some roundtable. Uh, what's new with uh, going on with you? I think I, uh, Mosaic, I believe, has that officially launched or not launched? Is, can somebody give us an update on uh, where that stands? Yeah, I can talk about uh, Mosaic a little bit. Um, Last Friday on September 20th, uh, the Polar Stern and the Featheroff sailed from Tromso uh, en route to the starting point. Um, and they're in the general neighborhood of where uh, they want to be the start. And I think the, the search for the Goldilocks flow has begun. <laughs> but after a decade of planning, it's really exciting to th see things uh, starting up. Cool. Well, I definitely the uh, the efforts at uh, getting word out to the general public are big. I have a lot of people that I know that are going. Have you heard about this great big program that's up in going on in the Arctic? So uh, kudos to the 
uh, public affairs folks for getting out the word to uh, the general public. There just seems to be a lot of excitement and enthusiasm uh, to go along on the adventure, if you will. Yeah, it's been really well organized, uh, both uh, by Avi and by uh, all the different nations. And there was a, a big event um, in Tromso uh, last Friday to kind of send the ship off. That was uh, with all with a band and speeches and everything. So it's 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 exciting. Cool. I think you'll have to get the Ice Bridge team over there. That was a pretty nice jump wave combination that Lynette showed us at the beginning of her uh, set of slides. <laughs> yeah, those are some good dance moves. <laughs> they were. Are there other things that are going on that people would like to uh, mention at this point? Hi, this is Betsy with uh, Arcus and the CIS Prediction Network. I just uh, put into the chat uh, a message that um, the CIS Prediction Network will be publishing the interim CIS Outlook report for the postseason 2019, and Walt Meyer will be leading that report. That's just meant to be a quick, short uh, summary of the season, and a full report with analysis um, is scheduled to be published in early 2020 after um, AGU. So we'll be looking for uh, feedback and anybody's um, interest and comments, uh, and please just send them to me. Uh, and that's Betsy at Arcus.org. Thanks. Thank you, Betsy. Others? It's Martin again. I okay, was in Martin Charlottesville. Again. Hi, I was in Charlottesville, Virginia last week for the conference on bridging science, art, and community in the new Arctic. And it was one of the very interesting things I learned was that a very large number of artists registered or indicated an interest in participating in the meeting and, and had to be sort of turned away as it were because there wasn't enough room. Um, I mention it because you know we're all required in some way to engage in education and outreach, um, which is an element, one aspect, possible aspects of broader impacts uh, in NSF language. Um, so I just, just remember there, are, there appear to be a lot of very interested writers and artists out there who would love to engage with the scientific community and um, even go on your join your field programs, become embedded, work with you as they gather material for, for their work, which can help communicate how important our work is. Neat. Uh, d during the meeting, Martin, was there any conversation about how people can make connections other than by word of mouth? Um, we did discuss that and discuss some different ways to improve that communication. Um, my first, you know, being an IOPIC um, fan, my thinking was we might be able to do something through IOPIC collaborations on the website, uh, perhaps through the Science Communication Forum. But we do need some sort of um, clearinghouse or matchmaking website or something where we could bring the scientists, writers, and artists together. Yeah, it's an interesting topic to consider, um, and, and maybe that's something to, to think about as uh, um, we welcome news of the fact that uh, the IARPIC uh, principles have given their blessing, if you will, to move ahead with the next five-year plan, so that might be a topic to be considered in that plan. Uh, any other comments? Hi, this is Walt. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Don's uh, um, mention of Mosaic. Um, I just put it in the, the chat. Look, there's a link to uh, a Mosaic page at, at uh, University of Colorado here who are 
at least one of the ones coordinating outreach. And um, you can get weekly updates on what's going on. Um, you can sign up for an email, I think, to do that, or just visit the website. So if folks are interested in following along Mosaic, um, that's a nice resource. Hey, Great, uh, thank you. Uh, this is Hayo. Um, I just wanted to um, highlight the fact that we have the Arctic Observing Summit coming up fast in uh, late March, early April in Akureyri, Iceland as part of Arctic Science Summit Week. There's a deadline for white paper submissions through the, uh, the Arctic Observing Summit uh, website, arcticobservingsummit.org. I'll, I'll post a link for that in the chat window here as well. And it's, it's a good time to, for, for this community in particular to think about um, how to uh, work on a white paper, potentially even a joint white paper that looks at what, what are some of the specific next steps that could be taken as there's consolidation of uh, sustained observations under the Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks Initiative or SEON. Sandy Starkweather uh, with NOAA is the vice chair of the SEON board and she and the broader say on board have been pretty active in laying out a much more specific roadmap um, uh, for Arctic observing. So as, as part of that, for example, there's now plans to put in place a food security working group that focuses on marine and coastal food security. And um, this group here certainly has expertise to contribute um, observations and, and broader perspective on how to best coordinate that. So I just wanted to highlight that um, Arctic Observing Summit, um, March 31st to April 2nd in Akureyri, Iceland. Thanks. Thanks, Hayo. Well, the hour is coming to an end. I think this uh, meeting was an excellent example of how the IARPIC collaboration network can be used in addition to three really interesting presentations. I appreciate the level of conversation people brought to the meeting and the use of the chat room to make a uh, whole host of links that will hopefully uh, folks will find useful. I would like to make a pitch for our next meeting in October, which I think will be October 28th. Is that right, Meredith? Shake your head up and down. Let me double check. <laughs> okay, while well, uh, she's double checking on the on the date of that meeting, I want to point out that the, we're, we're focusing, we're circling back on a meeting that we had a couple months ago, a joint meeting with some other teams about uh, hazardous algal blooms. And during that meeting, Don Anderson um, made specific requests to know more about who in the sea ice community might be able to uh, work with um, him and his team and others to help explain the role of sea ice in the timing of these blooms. So I hope uh, uh, those of you at, at this meeting and, uh, and the network of folks that you know will come uh, to that meeting in October so that we can help Don uh, Anderson uh, to fill the gap in, in knowledge there that they have with regard to the role of sea ice again in these hazardous algal blooms. Um, so we're looking forward to that meeting. Um, is it 28th of October, right? That's correct. Okay, and it'll be again at one o'clock. So we look forward to seeing many of you there. Again, thank you so much for uh, the conversation uh, and again, the, the great example of how this uh, collaborative network works. Have a great thank day. Um, take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.